The Bosporan Kingdom never carried out a wide territorial expansion, remaining in fact a tiny state, especially compared to its powerful neighbors. It seemed highly vulnerable and should have been wiped off the face of the earth after the first serious war. Nevertheless, the state turned out to be surprisingly tenacious and lasted more than 800 years, surviving both the Roman Empire and the Migration Period. The first Greek colonies on the coast of the Chimerian Bosporus were founded in the late 7th century BC by immigrants from Miletus. They were established on both sides of the strait on the type of Greek city-states, or polis. The core of the future kingdom was Panticapium, Nymphaeum and Theodosia in eastern Crimea, as well as Phanagoria and Hermonassa on the Taman Peninsula. Smaller settlements were also located around them, which were the part of one or another city-state. Here, on the very edge of Greek civilization, the neighbors of the Hellenes were predominantly nomadic tribes, barbarian in their understanding. And it was the relations with these peoples that would determine the fate of the Bosporan Kingdom throughout its history. The habitat of nomads was boundless. The movements of entire tribes remained practically invisible to the Greeks until the very last moment, and the biggest upheavals in the life of Chimerian Bosporus would always begin with another movement of the Eastern people. Periods of stability were set in the Bosporus only when the redistribution of spheres of influence among the nomads was completed. One of these stable periods was the very beginning of Greek colonization. The neighbors of the Greeks in the west were the Taurians, who lived in the Crimean mountains and were distinguished by hostility to strangers. In the east, the lands of the Greeks bordered the settlements of the Sindhi and Maiotians, with whom, unlike the Taurians, Greeks had good relations. In the north lived the Scythians, the leading force in this region and potentially the most dangerous enemy. There were also other centers of Greek colonization close by, such as Chersonesus and Pontic Olbia. To ensure the security of the colonies, the Bosporan Greeks needed to act together, because in the event of a war, the forces of one city-state would not be enough to repel an attack. The second important aspect was the constant improvement of the fortifications, because the nomadic armies acted in raids and were incapable of long sieges. And of course, the Greeks made considerable diplomatic efforts to avoid unnecessarily turning their neighbors against themselves. Valuable gifts to tribal leaders and later dynastic marriages were used, because the Greeks inevitably mixed with the local population over time. At the end of the 5th century BC, the Scythian tribes began to move, which forced the cities of Bosporus to conclude a defensive alliance with the center in Panticapium, led by the noble family of Archenectids. When the threat was passed, then there was no more need for this family to be in charge, which they were unlikely to accept. As a result, around 437 BC, a takeover took place in the Bosporus, and the ruler named Spartacus, probably a Thracian, seized power. This was the beginning of the actual Bosporan Kingdom and the Spartacid dynasty, which ruled for more than 300 years. Having raised an uprising in Panticapium, by the beginning of the 4th century BC, the Spartacids established themselves on both sides of the strait, having captured Nymphaeum, Theodosia and Phanagoria. Then they subjugated some of the surrounding peoples, including the Sins. The political situation in the first century of the Bosporan Kingdom's existence was favorable for development. Having no strong enemies, the mixed Greek barbarian state conducted successful trade along the Black and Aegean sea coasts and developed new territories. The influence of the Bosporus extended to the mouth of the Don, where the city of Tanais was founded. It became an important trading colony and a kind of outpost on the border with nomads. A good income was brought by exporting grain, one of the main buyers of which was Athens. Things were going so well that even the civil war between the sons of Perisades I did not cause serious damage to the state. The deterioration of the economic situation of the Bosporan Kingdom occurred after the changes in the hierarchy of neighboring nomadic peoples. From the middle of the 4th century BC, the penetration of the Sarmatians into this region began. The Scythians, pressed by them, intensified their onslaught on the Crimea and devastated the possessions of Chersonesus. 
the eastern possessions of the Bosporan kings were significantly reduced, and the people subject to them raised uprisings, counting on the support of the Sarmatians. It cost a lot of money to negotiate with a new force, and from the middle of the 2nd century BC an economic crisis began in the Bosporus. This, in turn, hit the state's defenses, since its army was heavily dependent on mercenaries. Unable to cope with the new barbarian threat, and having no funds to pay tribute, the last of the Spartakids, Perisedes V, turned for help to the king of Pontus, Mithridates VI. The Pontic Kingdom, meanwhile, was conducting a wide expansion along the entire Black Sea coast, trying to gain power before the upcoming war with Rome. It was possible to count on Mithridates' help only if the Bosporan Kingdom became a part of his state. Apparently, the situation was so critical that Bosporus considered it the lesser of evils and preferred to merge into another Hellenistic state rather than submit to the Sarmatians. Mithridates fulfilled his part of the agreement and neutralized the external threat. The Pontic army, led by the commander Diophantus, landed in Crimea and inflicted several defeats on the Scythians and Sarmatians. After that, Bosporus became part of the Pontic kingdom for more than 50 years. Mithridates managed to subjugate almost the entire perimeter of the Black Sea, but even this was not enough for him to successfully confront Rome. Already after the first war lost by Mithridates, the Bosporus tried to secede from his state and the rebellion had to be suppressed by force. When the third and the last war was lost, the son of Mithridates, Macares, the governor of the Bosporus, betrayed the king and concluded a separate peace with Rome. But Mithridates did not give up until the last. He managed to get from Pontus to the Bosporus by land. Macares, in fear of his father's revenge, committed suicide. Even in this situation, Mithridates intended to continue the war with Rome and was gathering an army to move west and invade Italy from across the Alps. But the situation was hopeless. Pompey organized a naval blockade of the Bosporus, and the enormous taxes that the king was forced to impose to raise an army turned into an uprising against him. When another son of Mithridates, Pharnacus, joined his opponents, the Pontic king chose to take his own life. Having become the king of the Bosporus, which regained its independence after the Pontic Kingdom's destruction, Pharnacus still wanted to return the lands that previously belonged to his dynasty. To begin with, he fortified new possessions, resubjugated the lands from the strait to Tanais, and at the same time closely followed the situation in Asia Minor. Meanwhile, in the east, the situation was unfavorable for the Romans. In 53 BC, there was a crushing defeat at Carre from Parthia, which stopped the eastern expansion of Rome, and four years later, a civil war broke out in the Republic. Taking advantage of this, Pharnacus gathered an army, including the Sarmatian troops, and moved by land towards his family nest. At first, he was successful. Pharnacus easily occupied Pontus and seemed to revive the kingdom of his father, but in 48 BC, Pompey was killed in Egypt, and Caesar freed his forces for a campaign in Asia Minor. Pharnacus, who had been planning his campaign for a long time, was defeated by Caesar as if in passing, and it was that victory that gave rise to the famous aphorism, I came, I saw, I conquered. Meanwhile, even before this defeat, an uprising had risen in the Bosporus under the leadership of the governor Asander. Returning back, Pharnacus was defeated by him too, and this time he fell in battle. Asander married his daughter Dynamis, and in this way established himself on the throne as a legitimate ruler. He even managed to repulse the attack of Mithridates of Pergamon, a friend of Caesar, whom he wanted to appoint the ruler of the Bosporus. While Rome was torn apart by civil war, the Bosporan kingdom retained its independence and fell under the empire's influence only under Augustus. It did not pose a threat to the Romans, as the forces were too unequal. But in its centuries-old history, the Bosporus developed strong ties with the barbarian world, and if both sides united against Rome, they would become a serious force. Therefore, Rome sought to establish a protectorate over the Bosporan kingdom, to turn it into its observation post over the barbarian world, and have an additional buffer between the empire and nomadic peoples. From the end of the 1st century BC, the Romans actively interfered in the affairs of the Bosporus. 
After the death of Asander, with the help of military force, they approved their protégé, Poleman I, as the new king. His power was secured by marriage with Dynamis. Poleman encountered great resistance in the new possessions and, in 8 BC, died in a battle with the army of the next king, Aspargus. Aspergus was the son of Asander and had Sarmatian roots. He was quite popular among the people, and his coming to power in the Bosporus was not seen as a concession to Rome. However, Rome's fears about the Sarmatian threat were not confirmed. The new king bore the title of friend of Caesar and friend of the Romans, and did not try to go against the emperor's will. Aspergus and his successors even took the dynastic name Tiberius Julius which apparently indicates that they were given the status of Roman citizens. The Bosporan kingdom became an ally of the empire. It supplied auxiliary troops to the Romans, strengthened the defensive line on the border with the nomads, and fought against pirates in the Black Sea. But the empire also fulfilled certain obligations in this unequal alliance. First of all, it concerned financing. The influence of the empire was also noticeable in the daily life of the Bosporus. For example, typical Roman entertainments took root there, such as gladiator fights and baiting of animals. Another attempt to free himself from Roman domination was made by the son of Aspergus, King Mithridates III. But the empire was then on the rise of its power and had enough of one legion to defeat an unwelcome ruler. From now on, the well-being of the Bosporus began to depend directly on the state of affairs in Rome. Economic crisis in the empire immediately affected the northern Black Sea region, but when the empire flourished, the Bosporus flourished too. By the middle of the 3rd century, Germanic tribes led by the Goths crept up to the empire's eastern borders. At that time, a long-term power crisis was in full swing in Rome when civil wars were constantly going on in addition to wars with external enemies. In this situation, Rome did not have enough strength to defend the Bosporus. The rulers in Paticopium could not hold back the new onslaught of the barbarians and preferred to make a deal with them. The Bosporan kingdom provided the Germanic peoples with their fleet, with the help of which they carried out devastating raids on Greece and Asia Minor. The Roman Empire eventually coped with this threat, but the line of defense of the Bosporus, built for centuries, was destroyed, and the kingdom itself fell into decay. This invasion was another step towards the barbarization of the Bosporus. A new mixed elite was formed, which included representatives of the Sarmatians, Goths and their allies. At the same time, with the penetration of Christianity into the Bosporus, the new nobility fell under its influence and retained contact with Constantinople. In the second half of the 4th century, a period of turmoil began in the kingdom's history, about which we know fragmentary information. From 336 AD, under the first Christian king Rescuporis VI, the minting of Bosporan coins stopped, which indicated civil wars and ongoing economic decline the Roman troops finally left Crimea. It is known that King Sarumatis V in 362 AD turned to Emperor Julian in search of an alliance, and it was no longer about financial support from the Empire. On the contrary, the Bosporans were ready to pay for this friendship. The invasion of the Huns touched the Bosporus, one might say, on a tangent. Part of the eastern possessions was lost, but the western one survived, and the Tiberius Julius dynasty remained in power until the end of the 5th century. Perhaps not all rulers belong to this family, but at least they appropriated such an affiliation to strengthen their power. The last of them was a certain Ductanus, when the connection with Byzantium was still strong. That determined the future fate of the kingdom. Trying to prevent the complete capture of the Crimean Peninsula by the peoples of the collapsed Hunnic Union, the Byzantine Emperor Justinian I included the territories of the Western Bosporus into his state. This ended the history of the Bosporan Kingdom.